This video is sponsored by The Daily Upside, a free high quality business and investing newsletter. Check out the link in the description below to sign up for free. Corporate bankruptcy, a subject that we've all kind of heard about, might have seen some examples throughout our lifetime of, and it is something that's important to understand. Obviously, all investors face some sort of bankruptcy risk with their holdings, and I was actually looking to make a video on personal bankruptcy to talk about the rules there, uh, but my God, <laughs> companies are coming out left, right, and center, announcing their bankruptcies. Within the crypto space, obviously there's the big news around Voyager, Celsius, and 3AC, 3 Euro Capital. All three of which were accepting client deposits or otherwise managing client money, often promised high returns and are now all defunct. And it's starting to raise a lot of questions because most people have an understanding that bankruptcy is a real risk as an investor in a company. But what about when you invest through a company that goes bankrupt. So today I'm gonna to cover bankruptcy at a high level, going over kind of the general rules that apply and what to understand about the area if you're an investor, but also go over these more specific situations and explain the rules that play here and whether investors here are totally screwed over or if there are some protections here. Uh, because as you'll see, bankruptcy doesn't always mean losing all your money. And obviously bankruptcy rules do vary from country to country. I will focus on US law because generally speaking, a lot of investors around the world will have at least some US exposure in their portfolio. So I think it's a good kind of base level to, to cover the subject. Without further ado, let's hop into it. Now, as you might be aware, there are multiple types of bankruptcy that a company can go through, but there are two kind of main ones that you see the most of, and that's chapter seven bankruptcy and chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now chapter seven bankruptcy is kind kind of the worst case scenario. It's when a company is effectively going to shut down because it can no longer afford to pay off its creditors, can no longer meet its obligations, and therefore needs to be liquidated. That means to have all of its assets kind of rounded up and sold off to pay as many people as possible that this company owes money to. And generally speaking, because the company itself wasn't able to save itself and meet these obligations, one of its creditors or one of the stakeholders is going to get the short end of the stick, right? Someone's going to end up losing some of the money they lent this company because on a net basis, there's just not enough to go around. And how that's generally determined is based on the seniority of the debt and whether a debt is secured or not. Secured debt tends to get first claim and that refers to any debt that has collateral. A mortgage is an example of a secured loan because your house is put up as collateral for this loan so that if you don't make your payments, the creditor has the right to claim and try to sell that house. Um, so with companies, they'll often put up different assets as collateral, whether it be factory, warehouses, whatever have you, uh, to try and get better rates for loans. After the secured debts, you have the unsecured debts, which is generally determined by the seniority. You'll have some bonds called senior bonds and some bonds called junior bonds. And as you might expect, the senior bonds get lower returns as well, you know, lower interest payments from the company but also get paid first in this case of bankruptcy. And if you get to a point where all the debts are settled, then you get to the shareholders who are kind of the lowest in the pecking order. They accept the highest return potential in the sense that if the company profits, they benefit as well, but they face this very high risk in the case of bankruptcy where they're the last ones paid. They get the scraps, if you will. And when all said and done, the company will cease operations. There's no attempt to save the company. Everything's being sold to try and recoup as much money as possible. It is the end of the business. Now, an alternative to that, if the company believes that it just needs a bit of a break and might be able to rebound from this and might be able to survive, there is chapter 11 bankruptcy. So bankruptcy alone doesn't mean that a company is 100% going out of business. Chapter 11 bankruptcy allows the company to restructure, which means renegotiating debts, selling assets, cutting costs, doing whatever it can to try and get to a point where it will now stay afloat, where it can be more sustainable. And through this process, the company is protected, which just means that any kind of outstanding lawsuits from creditors who might not be getting paid and you know obviously want their money back, they're sort of put on pause. Everything is given a bit of a break to try and sort this out. And while a company will generally try to carry out a chapter 11 bankruptcy before a chapter seven, because you know investors have a better chance of maybe getting some of their money back and you know the higher ups who want to keep their jobs. Chapter 11 bankruptcy can be a much more expensive and a much longer process than chapter seven bankruptcy. So at a high level, those are the two types of bankruptcy. Now, what does all this mean for the investors? Well, naturally it's, it's not good. <laughs> and especially a chapter seven bankruptcy tends to be one of the worst case scenarios as an investor. If you invest in the company in question, shareholders get very little, if not nothing in the vast majority of cases. And even bondholders, people who have bought the bonds of these companies, including public investors like you or I, 
it might end up with just a fraction of what they originally spent on this bond that they purchased. Now as for chapter 11, it can be a better situation because there's this hope that the company might actually turn around. And through the bankruptcy process, you can actually continue trading shares of the company. Although in the vast majority of cases, investors are really put through the ringer. The stock price tends to fall very steeply leading up to and oftentimes after the bankruptcy is announced as the risk of losing all your money has greatly risen. It's also worth mentioning that part of this restructuring may involve altering the terms of the investment you put money into. So a bond might end up with a lower agreed interest rate. So you end up getting paid a lower coupon than what you originally agreed to. And shareholders might also get you know less of the company. If for example, someone comes and bails them out or whatever have you, the terms around your original investment will likely change. So obviously there's a lot of risk that comes with bankruptcy. It's not just that you'll very, very likely lose money. It's that the actual, what you own might change as well through the restructuring process. So even if the company comes out the other end, there's a very high risk that you end up losing money. So it generally comes down to the investor's preference, whether they wanna ride this out or sell early at a very, very steep loss. Now let's shift to talking about people who invest through firms that might end up going bankrupt. And we'll start with pensions because they're a lot easier to discuss. Obviously, if a company is lying <laughs> about its pension and that's what's led it to this sort of bankruptcy position, there is still risk there with bankruptcy. But generally speaking, the rules are that pension assets are completely separate from a company's assets. So creditors cannot go after a pension of a company and its employees when that company is going bankrupt. So there should be some protections there for investors. Now, when it comes to brokerages, companies that you buy investments through, the same principle is supposed to apply where client assets are separate from the company's assets. And in fact, when a broker is unable to meet its obligations and when it's failing, it doesn't generally fall under bankruptcy legislation, but rather a different law called the Securities Investor Protection Act of 1970 which gives more priority to clients of the company and basically looks to give them back their assets, or at the very least in the case of a liquidation, will look to give cash to these investors to try and compensate them for the lost market value of their holdings. And in fact, one of the first steps of the bankruptcy process is to send client assets to another solvent broker so that clients can access their money and you know go about with the savings they've accumulated. There are also other safeguards in place to help protect investors. On the one hand, a lot of financial institutions have capital requirements where they're required to have a certain amount of liquid assets, things like cash and, and close to cash assets to help cover withdrawal obligations. And all SEC registered broker dealers are actually required to be members of the Securities Investor Protection Corporation, which is basically a big insurance policy, if you will, that protects investors if the broker that they're dealing with goes under. And importantly, this doesn't cover regular losses or, you know, negative returns from positions. You know, if you lose money on a position, you can't go file an, an insurance claim as nice as that would be. If you own Google shares with the broker and that broker can no longer give you those Google shares for whatever reason, you know, they're failing on their payments and they lost your shares. This insurance corporation would compensate you for up to half a million dollars in total assets. And the banking industry actually has very similar protection as well under the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which similarly provides insurance, if you will, for up to a quarter million dollars or $250,000 for bank deposits. So if a bank has a bank run or whatever goes out of business can't produce the money it owes you, this insurance corporation will step in. And like brokers, banks can't typically file for bankruptcy despite the namesake. They're instead dealt with through the FDIC, which will basically absorb the company's assets and again, try to get them to their clients, which makes sense for the industry because by far the largest balance sheet item for a lot of these companies, including more established banks, is customer deposits or clients' money. And this is a very common thing in many developed countries. Here in Canada, we have CIPF insurance as well as CDIC insurance, which play the similar roles as to the two US institutions. But here's where things get dicey because in the world of crypto exchanges and crypto brokers, many of these same safety nets, as many people are learning, don't exist. Many of these crypto exchanges and platforms that will accept deposits, if you will, aren't actually registered as proper financial institutions. And even those brokers that are registered don't necessarily offer any protection. In fact, to quote Robinhood's website, cryptocurrency investments through Robinhood Crypto are not protected by SIPC, and Robinhood Crypto is not a member of FINRA or SIPC. Now, as for why this type of insurance coverage doesn't exist in the world of cryptocurrency, Coinbase's website and another you know, popular crypto exchange says it the best. Cryptocurrency is not legal tender and is not backed by the government. Cryptocurrency is not insured or guaranteed by the subject to Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or Securities Investor Protection Corporation. 
In case of a covered security event, so basically if Coinbase takes out its own insurance policy, we will endeavor to make you whole. However, total losses may exceed insurance recoveries, so your funds may still be lost. For a company that takes deposits and offers brokerage services, that's a pretty concerning line. And probably the, the cherry on top here, you know, the worst aspect of all this, is that some of these companies are now starting to argue that they were never brokerages. You see, there are lawyers for some of the companies that are filing for bankruptcy right now that are arguing that the company doesn't provide brokerage service, but instead had received loans from its customers. So these weren't customer accounts in the traditional sense. These were customers lending money to these institutions to use as they please, and these institutions would pay that deposit rate that it promised. Essentially saying that, no, we're not a brokerage, we're just a business that took out a loan and now we can't pay this loan back. And obviously the protections under those two situations are very, very different. If for whatever reason, the ruling was that the customers who had open accounts with these institutions were actually just lending money, whether or not a customer gets their money back will go all the way back to the bankruptcy procedure. And given that these are largely unsecured loans, or at least that's what's being argued, they would fall very, very low in priority here. Even though obviously that's not what was marketed to a lot of customers. Now, it remains to be seen whether these companies, which again are filing for chapter 11 bankruptcy, so that restructuring, whether their arguments will hold up in court. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really give a good opinion there. I would believe that it's unlikely to hold up just given the fact that these people were obviously told one contract, if you will, like they were given one set of terms because even verbal contracts, you know, have to have a clear communication of terms. So if you're sold one idea, but then the person does another, it's not legal, but either way, clearly investor money is at risk. Uh, maybe there's a chance these companies do have the money to pay back their customers, but if they're making these kind of arguments about, you know, this being corporate loans rather than deposits, I have questions about whether the money's even still there. I hope that if you are an investor in crypto that you aren't caught up in all this, but honestly, I'd be surprised if I don't have a few people who have been because these were big institutions. And you know, with some being backed by very big figures, a lot of people had faith here. And there's only so much you can do when the companies you have faith in are lying to you. Anyway, I hope this video helped to clear up how investors are affected by bankruptcies, both for companies that they're invested in and those that they invest through. A quick thank you to CoffeeZilla, who's been covering these events very in depth and whose recent Voyager video basically kind of motivated me to cover this subject. And another quick thank you to the video sponsor, The Daily Upside. You've probably heard of them before. Excellent newsletter that covers market-specific content, much like these types of stories, and loved by a lot of other finance YouTubers. They send stuff six days a week and use a team of former journalists, scholars, and financial professionals to dive deep into really interesting stories. In the area of crypto, they recently put a company called Flow Carbon under the spotlight, a firm that was selling crypto that was meant to be backed by carbon credits for the purpose of tracking and trading offsets for pollution which sounds great until you realize that the main registry of these carbon credits basically axed their plans and now their launch plans are on pause. So if you like learning about this kind of stuff, they're a great source for these kinds of stories. I read them daily, upside. And the best part is that unlike Voyager, if the daily upside goes bankrupt, you don't lose any money because they are completely free. They are a free newsletter. And yes, I know that's a low blow, but I like my free services. <laughs> so check them out. It's a great service, completely free and it supports the channel. So thank you, The Daily Upside. I hope you like this video. Uh, it's a bit of a different format from what I traditionally do. So let me know in the comments down below if you like this type of format. And also if you're someone who has worked with one of these institutions or has money currently stuck with one of these brokers, I'd really be interested to hear your story and hear your thoughts. As an outsider who doesn't use any of these services, it would be really interesting to see that side of it. And also just, you know, any thoughts you have about everything we've covered today. And yeah, I really do appreciate you joining today. So that's all for now. And as always, be safe out there.